Hey everybody, thank you so much, it's great to be here. My name is Edwin Olson, I'm a professor at the University of Michigan in the Computer Science Department. And basically my job is to look out in the world and figure out what sorts of problems there are that we can build robots to solve. So it doesn't matter a whole lot to me whether the robots are little arms operating on, on tabletops or whether they're big robots. I go around and I think about what sorts of problems do we have? Do you have a dirty room that you want to get cleaner? Let's get a robot to build it. Do you want to build a car that can drive itself? Let's, let's do that. Maybe you're a musician and you want to have a robotic accompanist that can play the piano part as you play your violin. And these are all cool problems that I like to solve and I think I have a pretty cool job to do that. But it's fair to say that I have really robots on the brain. It's, it's, it's almost an affliction. And so you might wonder, how did I get to be this way? Well, there were early warning signs. <laughs> early warning signs. Uh, the kids in the audience all know what this is, but for the parents who are maybe a little rusty, this is clearly an interplanetary spaceship. I like building things. I still really like building things. I like to be able to hold something in my hand and say, yeah, that's mine. Um, I also was really into computers. So at about the age of you guys, <laughs> I, I started writing programs and you just could not get me to stop writing programs. I was so enthusiastic about it. Uh, I, I did actually wear this and I'd love to be able to tell you that it was Halloween. <laughs> so at this point, I, I, I decided to go off into college and to study electrical engineering and computer science. Seemed like a good thing to do. Uh, so I discovered as I was doing this that robotics was the perfect combination of these two things. I could build the robots and then I could program them. So I went through uh, the bachelor's degree and I built some pretty cool robots. And I got, came out the other end and I was thinking, these robots are pretty cool, but they're pretty limited too. So what I wanted to do was to build bigger, better, more complicated robots. So I hung around and got a master's degree. And so the master's degree, I built even bigger, cooler robots. And at the end of that, guess what happened? I was thinking, these robots are pretty cool, but uh, I want to build cooler robots yet. So I hung around and got a PhD. And while I was doing a PhD, I, I built some of the coolest robots uh, on the planet, I think. Uh, but then I look around and I see all these other problem domains where we could build robots that would be able to help people solve real problems that are important to society. So after getting the PhD, I decided, let's, let's do the professor thing. Right? And so my job, again, is to basically look around for cool problems to solve with robots, build the robots, program them, and that's a pretty cool job. One of the robots that I built was this autonomous car. Now, who here can tell me what autonomous means? Yeah. Without humans, right. So this is a robot that makes its own decisions. You can see up on top, there's a, a bunch of crazy stuff attached to the roof rack. Those are sensors. So the first thing that you need to do if you're building a robot that can make its own decisions is be able to gather information about what the world looks like. Then all of this information goes back to a computer. We think, we try to figure out what, what all this information means and try to figure out what to do about it. So one of the things that we, since this is a car, the types of things that we might do are turn the steering wheel, press on the gas, press on the brake. Now autonomous robots are, to me, part of the coolest, the ki coolest kind of robots because there's a lot of things that we take for granted as humans. Let, let's try something very, very simple. Uh, everybody point up. Yeah, yeah, uh, most of you got that right. <laughs> That's pretty simple, right? But this actually is a pretty hard problem. You're, you're taking sensory data, you're processing it, combining data from multiple sensors, and actually using your, your muscles to point up, right? And you didn't have to work very hard at that, did you? It's pretty easy. If you're building a robot, none of that comes for free. You have to do all of that yourself. And that's part of the fun and part of the challenge. Let's try another one. Everybody point at the guy who's talking on stage. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Uh, this, is, this is another really complicated one. Now you're combining information about context, the, the sort of grammar of me standing on a stage. You're combining background information, visual information. When you look at me, your brain is just popping out and saying, person, right? And I'll couple all this together, it's really cool what humans can do. But again, robots don't start off with this ability. We have to implement all of these capabilities ourselves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some video of this car driving. And in a few seconds into the video, what you're going to see is the view of the world from the robot.
And what you're going to see are a bunch of little circular patches. This is how the robot understands the world. It doesn't look at the world and see lanes, cars, people. It sees these little silly circular patches sliding around. Let's, let's take a look. So here's our autonomous car. It's driving up to an intersection. It's collecting information about its surroundings. And here is that display I'm talking about, these little circles. And it's by tracking these circles that we're able to figure out things about where other cars are in the world. In this case, we're using that information to figure out that we've arrived at an intersection. It's a four-way stop sign, and the rules of the road tell us that we have to wait for all the other cars to go first before it's our turn to go. So these guys are, are out to, to catch us breaking the rules. They're waiting a very long time. <laughs> Not New York drivers. But they clear the intersection, and our robot now is using its sensor information and is deciding that now is the time to go. So it drives across the road. And what you can see right there is that there's nobody inside this vehicle. So this is an autonomous vehicle. I think it's one of the coolest kinds of vehicles, robots. I've been spending a lot of my time lately thinking about how groups of robots can address some of the problems in society. There's been a lot of bad news, in the, uh, a lot of bad news about tornadoes going through more Oklahoma. Um, you can see really a swath of devastation uh, where the tornado went through. Uh, there's also a factory collapse uh, where, where a lot of people were hurt. And one of the questions you might ask is how can we use robots to solve these sorts of problems? And so the idea here is basically, let's build a group of robots. You can see our group of robots there. Send them in. They search the building. We're not putting humans in danger while we're looking for people who need help. When we find something, we can work alongside humans to go and render help. So there are other types of problems that are very similar to this. Uh, any, anybody can think of an example. What's a problem that's kind of like search and rescue in terms of using multiple robots to go and find something cool? Yeah. Sunken ships, yeah, absolutely. So we use robots to go underwater and take a look at, at the, the for example, the Titanic. Yes. Uh, yeah. Say it again. Building fires, absolutely. So very similar to search and rescue. You might also think about interplanetary exploration. Let's put a team of robots on Mars looking for rocks that the geologists find interesting. Or surveying, imagine environmental applications. Maybe there's a coral reef that's being hit hard by, by uh, pollution. Let's build a group of robots that are going to monitor this coral reef, collect information, and tell us what's really going on. So we're really excited about this sort of, sort of uh, uh, problem domain where multiple robots can work, to, work together. The other thing about these systems, which is kind of cool, is that they're autonomous, but they're actually semi-autonomous. One of the things that we want to do is figure out how can we bring humans back into the loop and take advantage of all of the knowledge that humans have in order to make the whole system work better. Right? In a search and rescue mission, the robots are out there looking for people, but there's still the, the you know, ambulances or the, the geologists back home who want the samples that they're finding. So these problems all have something in common with each other. They're a lot like playing hide and seek. So the robots in this case are the seekers, and the things that we're looking for are the hiders. Right? So we want to be able to send robots out, be able to have those robots explore, find all the good hiding spots that it didn't know about, and be able to help us find, uh, find whatever we're looking for. All right, so I actually brought some of my robots here today to play hide and seek. Uh, I'd like to have our four volunteers come up on stage. So what we're going to do is we're going to have t two humans play the parts of the seekers, and the other two people are going to play the parts of the hiders. So what we're going to do is we're going to have you two be our hiders. Does that sound good? And you two be our seekers. So the seekers go ahead and sit down with Lauren, who is one of my PhD students. And the hiders, what you get to do is actually two things. So we're going to first rearrange all these walls so that we know that the robot is in a new environment that has never been before. And then we're going to find a hiding spot. You want to do it? All right, Mr. Simmons, can we have some good hiding music? All right, come on, let's hide. So we can move these wherever you want. Should we? Yeah, go ahead, drag them around. Yeah. That's good, that's good. There we go. Make sure that the robot's gonna be able to get around here. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Let's switch over to the big display. What we're gonna look at now is the display that our seekers, who are using our robots as their helpers, are, are going to see. First thing you see is here are our robots over here, and they don't see a whole lot of the world, right? They see these, these surroundings immediately around them. 
Um, and so one of the games is for them to go around and be able to look for the people. Now to orient you a little bit, the top edge is the back of the stage. So it's like we're looking down on the world from above. This interface is actually inspired by computer games. And so you can see the two robots next to each other. And so what, our, what we're going to do is we're going to have one of our seekers command one of our robots to explore around a little bit. Now the blue stuff represents obstacles. The white stuff represents stuff that we don't, we don't know what's there. And the orange represents area that we think it's safe to drive. All right, so let's go ahead and command one of these robots to drive around. So this is where that semi-autonomy comes into play. We, the robots are making a lot of decisions on their own, uh, including once they're told where to go. So we're basically clicking on a robot and then clicking again where we want them to go. So the basic idea here is that the humans are suggesting places for the robots to go, and the robot's job is to figure out how to actually get from point A to point B. So they're looking out for obstacles. They're actually also looking for the kids. So if we can go back to the, the map display, Let's get these, these robots moving around. We've got both of the robots now in action, looking around, and great. So let's, let's send these robots out hunting for these, these hiders. Right, and you can see that as the robots spread out, they're collecting information about what they see, and that information's being transmitted back to our seekers at the computer station. So as the robots move around, they're collecting more and more information about what the environment really looks like. And you can see the orange area is growing bigger and bigger. Oh, and what is that? One of those robots has found one of our hiders. All right, so I think it's found. Uh... Hi there, you've been found. Good job. You can stand up, but stay right there for a minute. All right. Now let's continue look. Oh, I got to get out of the way. Let's continue looking around for the, the second hider. <laughs> so you can see that the robot is really deciding what it wants to do itself. It's not just going to the arrow. Its goal is to get to the little star, but it's going to find the safest path that it can to get there. And you can see that we're uh, getting some video feed from that robot. It's very low quality. One of the big challenges in a system like this is actually to use as little radio bandwidth as possible. If you were exploring a new building and you knew you were looking for something, imagine that you, sitting over there, actually have 20 robots with you. <laughs> Did we find, oh, we found the other one. Yeah. All right, fantastic. It's great, so let's give a big round of applause to our hiders. and a big round of applause to our seekers who uh, very ably operated our system. Good job, thank you everybody. So how many of you think this would be a useful system if you were looking for something in a building? Yeah. Building a system like this is a lot of fun. So let's go to my next slide. It seems to imagine that you now agree with me that I have a cool job. One question you might ask yourself is, how do I get a job like this? And how many of you like math? How many of you not such a big fan? Right, so robotics is almost all mathematics. So the more math you know, whether it's geometry, trigonometry, algebra, it's all going to come to bear when programming a robot. So one of the things you need to do in order to become a roboticist is really be an expert at math, all kinds of math. Another skill that you need is to be able to work with a computer, in particular being able to program. And the best way to become a good programmer is to write lots and lots of programs. So I started programming when I was in fourth grade. Um, I sold my first computer program when I was in sixth grade. So I, I just keep writing programs, whether it's getting an Arduino or Lego Mindstorms. The more code you write, the better you're gonna get. And the last thing that you need in order to be a good roboticist is some fire in your belly. Right? You need to have passion for some problem that you really want to solve. And maybe for you, it's the problem of making cars safer so that people don't get into accidents. Or maybe, maybe for you, you're really motivated by sending robots to Mars to look for interesting rocks. Right? But at the end of the day, you need to have some passion that's going to drive you to build these really complicated systems that can do cool stuff like this. So if you find your passion, 
and you develop the skills that you need in order to pursue that passion, before you know it, you'll have a cool job too. Thank you very much. Thank you.